On the one hand, I have this incredibly inexpensive N100DC ITX motherboard. This motherboard is a motherboard that comes with a processor. It's basically just add RAM and you're good to go. You don't even need a power supply. Okay, you need a, it's a DC power supply, but it doesn't actually take an ATX power supply. That's on the one hand. On the other hand, I've got this Supermicro Half Depth 1U. This is a 505-2. This thing is basically a decade old. This is an old system that's based on the Cherry Trail Atom CPUs that die. It's been modified with the resistor mod in order to make it boot. This thing's not very fast and it runs at 2.4 gigahertz. What we're gonna do is shove this in there because this is like $100 or less. Let's get to it. Okay, first up, why do you wanna do this? One, it's because this is a quad core processor, okay? It's the efficiency cores, basically. Not really, exactly, sorta, of, kinda. But this is really meant for like an information worker desktop PC. This is configured for a desktop PC. It's really not configured for a 24 seven embedded system. But it is insanely inexpensive. Whereas when you get a motherboard for something like this, it's designed for 24 seven uptime, it's usually got remote management. That's gonna add at least $100 to the bottom line price, really like $130, like that A-speed chipset alone, like the bomb cost is pretty high on that. Plus, you know, the board that's in here has four onboard NICs. This only has one, don't worry, we've got to solve for that. And uh, you know, this is, this is not an apples to apples conversion. This is turning e-waste into not exactly e-waste for a non-profit and or a, like a home usage scenario. This running a lightweight Proxmox installation with eight or 16 gigabytes and a single DDR4 DIMM for pie hole and everything else is not an unreasonable use for it. There are actually some BIOS options in the motherboard we're gonna take a look that makes it sort of suited to the 24 seven use case. We'll see how the reliability stacks up because I'm gonna actually use this for 24 seven. But for now, let's dive in. So our One U Super Micro System actually still has a, a fair bit of usable parts in it. You don't necessarily have to use the N100DC ITX from ASRock. You could find another motherboard that fits in here. We've actually got a pretty good 80 plus power supply. Although again, it's pushing 10 years old. But it is a standard ATX type connection. This is an ITX motherboard. We've also got a right angle eight lane PCIe Gen 3 riser to give us a single full height half length PCIe slot. These chassis are designed for either a single SATA drive or you know a dual SATA RAID 1 type setup. They're meant to be networking appliances uh -huh, as evidenced by the IO where we've got a remote management network and then four dedicated NICs. This is the 2758F variant of the motherboard. Don't worry, I'm gonna save the motherboard. In fact, if you've got a pretty good use for it and you hit me up on the level one forum, I might even just give it to you. It, it does work, but again, it's got the resistor mod. It requires the resistor mod to boot because these Cherry Trail processors got problems. A tiny ultra flow fan, it is a standard size fan. In fact, our friends at Arctic make fans that will fit in this chassis. Rest well, you've had a good life. A decade of service. Almost uninterrupted if it weren't for that little resistor thing. Now, there's a couple other things that make this motherboard sort of special. One is the DC input jack. This is where it's gonna actually run from. This is basically a laptop power brick. You can run this off of a, a 19 volt power input. The motherboard also provides a power connector. If you don't have a regular power supply, how are you gonna plug a SATA device in? It comes with this breakout cable, which will give you two normal SATA connections that give you five and 12 volt uh, connections on your uh, two and a half inch SATA drive. Now, if you still wanted to run this off of an ATX power supply, you could, but it would require some modification of your power supply because the motherboard does not actually have a power input connector. Mm. So we've, we run into a bit of a compatibility issue here. The, uh, the audio gets in the way of the PCIe standoff. Now you got a couple options to make that work. You could just uh, lob off the metal part here, but really you can get away without the metal part, unless you're gonna ship it UPS, of course. And then maybe don't do that. Actually, FedEx around here is worse. UPS generally is okay unless you have to ship international. The contest winners where we've shipped computers, that has not gone well. 
as long as you screw in your network card and your network card is not overly massive and you're not shipping this thing via a carrier, you don't really need the metal support for the riser. Now we'll go ahead and warn you that when you're making these kinds of modifications, you really also need to think about heat dissipation. We've only got the single fan here, which is blowing directly over our CPU cooler, and that's probably gonna be sufficient. But we don't really have anything over on this side for the network card. We do have another four pin fan header. We can add another blower style fan or another small form factor fan like this, but we probably are gonna need another fan somewhere over in here to deal with cooling our network card and to just pro provide a little extra airflow. When you, when you get into this kind of a modding, Thing, it really doesn't make sense to do this for commercial or business or anything except the most dirt poorest of people, individuals, nonprofits, whatever. Now for memory, even though Intel doesn't qualify ECC memory on this platform, uh, it doesn't mean that you should use gamer memory. I'm using a boring Samsung OEM stick of memory that is non-ECC, but it's not gamer, it's not XMP, it's nothing but these generally will have a higher, longer lifetime reliability than a lot of gamer memory out there. Not all gamer memory, depends on how it's built, depends on who put it together, depends on a lot of things, but generally this uh, Samsung DIMM is probably not gonna die. Now we've got one, one gigabit NIC and two 10 gigabit NICs, but we can add more NICs. We're gonna try adding an E-key two and a half gig NIC and we've also got dual two and a half gig M.2. So we can add two more two and a half gig NICs to this, plus maybe another one. Now let's talk about the front panel connection for a second. When you got one of these, the front panel connections, these are not even remotely standard. They're not even a little bit standard. So the front panel connections for the motherboard that you're going way off script to use, and the front panel connections on your 1U e-waste that you're recycling, um, probably don't match. And so you're gonna have to spend a little bit of time searching for front panel pinout or remake the front panel in a way that makes sense for whatever you're doing. One of the things I like about this platform is that ASRock hasn't locked down the BIOS and you can configure a lot of options, which is handy when you're going off label. Like I say, this is really meant for very low cost information worker desktop computer with a little bit of flexibility. Imagine this in a very small, you know, six inch by six inch square with a laptop power brick screwed to the bottom of somebody's desk. That's sort of the envisioned use case here. But because they haven't locked it down, it's actually very flexible for a lot of other use cases. So for our use case, we want it to always power back on whenever it loses power, and we even want it to turn itself back on if for some reason it's off, and that's power on by RTC. So those are BIOS options. There's another BIOS option called Boot Guard, that if you enable that, it will enable the system to reset the BIOS or reconfigure the BIOS or try more conservative memory settings, whatever, just to try to get the system up and booting. Because we're booting off of SATA, that's the default boot device. And so if something goes catastrophically wrong, it'll just reset the BIOS and try to boot from the SATA SSD. On the SATA SSD, we can also configure it with uh, RS-232. So like when you boot into Linux, you can send grub to the serial prompt. And so you can use the serial port on this motherboard to connect to something else so that you can still remotely manage your system even though it doesn't have an onboard management controller. Basically, if it's getting power, it's gonna boot. And if it's not booting, something has gone catastrophically wrong with the storage device or other physical piece of hardware. Because if the motherboard is working correctly, it will boot. And if it's not booting, it will reset itself, which will then let it boot from SATA. So there you go. If you're running a Linux operating system and you set up MD, so that you mirror your boot partitions and you mirror all of your other partitions and one of your SSDs dies, you will be able to boot off of the other SSD or I should say the system will automatically choose the other SSD if the first SSD isn't available. If there's operating system corruption, you'd have to use the RS-232 link in order to select the other operating system to boot from in order to figure out what went wrong. It's basically serial console territory at that point. And yes, it would be nice to have like a full fat IPMI, but this motherboard costs less than $100. What do you want? The built-in LAN is a Realtek 8111H. That is unfortunately just gigabit, not 2.5 gigabit. You can splurge a little bit more and get a dual two and a half gig NIC version of this motherboard or a single two and a half gig, uh, or a single two and a half gig NIC version. But our M.2 G codes is actually a cheaper proposition and gives you more LAN ports. I've got this thing up and running and I've been doing some 
Proxmox testing and burn and testing and that kind of stuff, just sort of leaving it on the desk uh, with and without the cover on it, just to see if that helps with the fan. I am gonna have to add a second fan because our, uh, our second Nick, ooh, it's running super toasty. But it is seeing all five Nicks, which is pretty awesome. I did try with the error correcting memory just to see if it worked anyway. And it happened to post, but the ECC EDAC options in Linux, not so much. Uh, if we talk about uh, per core performance, I'm pretty happy it's about two and a half times faster per core versus the old cherry trail for the stuff that I was doing. And some things are actually dramatically way faster because it can leverage new instruction sets and all that sort of stuff on the new CPUs. I mean, at the end of the day, this is an N100 CPU, so it's not dramatically different, but it does use a vanishingly small amount of power and the heat sink doesn't even get warm. I am running Proxmox on this too, which is a little strange, like just a four core machine with Prox. Why would you, why would you do that? Why, why, that doesn't make sense. And I would concede that actually doesn't make sense, but I am running some virtualized workloads that I want to move between VLANs and I don't want to uh, distro hop and I don't want to tear down bare metal and restore it and, and that kind of thing. Is, it, is this gonna be another forbidden router video? Not yet, but experiments are underway, so we'll see. The N100 DC performance is surprisingly good for information oriented stuff, like for information worker, I'm just gonna enter some things. If you were gonna boot up and run Windows on this, it actually does have some pretty good support for that. The HDMI app, for example, if you're running Windows 10 or Windows 11, HDMI audio is handled differently because of course it is on the, uh, the Intel iGPU. There's a BIOS option that lets you toggle between the Windows 10 mode and the Windows 11 mode because it is a little bit of a hardware aspect to that, which is not, you know, if you upgraded to Windows 11 and your HD audio stopped working, you probably need a BIOS update or it might not be fixable with a BIOS update because of certain hardware choices that were made. But ASRock has got a competent, well put together BIOS on this motherboard with a surprisingly large number of features for what this motherboard is meant to do. For my off-label use case, I'm pretty happy so far. We'll see if it hangs in there for the long haul. I'm one of this level one, I'm signing out. You can find me in the level one forums. If you're thinking about your own project with this, uh, come to the forums and ask questions. It'll be there for posterity. Post pictures, let's see what's going on. There's so much room for activities in this tiny one U case. I love it. All right, I'm signing out and I'll see you later.